Welcome to everybody, sisters and brothers and friends, no matter where you are in the world. And this is the second of four webinars which UIST is pleased to co-host with the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors and the Centre of Child Protection of the Gregorian University and Telefono Azzurro. So just to put this in a certain context, at the last UISG assembly in May 2019, the members of UISG assembled there, the leaders of women's, women religious congregations worldwide, reflected together on what needed to be put in place in order to develop a culture of care and safeguarding. And obviously education is key to the development of this kind of culture. Both our own education as individual religious men and women, the education of all our collaborators and associates, and the education of children and vulnerable adults who are in our institutions, our programs and our projects. So this is a challenge for leadership at every level. And in that, we are all leaders, and we're all being called to show this kind of leadership. So we realized that we needed to learn from the mistakes mm. of our past and commit ourselves to put in place necessary policies, guidelines, and protocols. But that these needed not just to be written documents, but real active procedures that are actively implemented, regularly updated and evaluated. So now it is with great pleasure that I hand you over to Emer McCarthy from the Political Commission for the Protection of Minors, who's the project manager, and she will introduce Father Hans Olner to you. Many thanks. Good morning, everyone, and on behalf of the President of the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, of all of our members all across the world, those who are joining us today for the seminar from our working group on formation and education, which is led by Father Zollner, thank you for joining us today. Our thanks to UISG and the Centre for Child Protection and Telefono Azzurro, Italy's child line, for this initiative, which was deeply desired by our members. Father Hans Zollner is president of the Centre for Child Protection at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, and he's also a consultant to the Congregation for the Clergy. He has a doctoral degree in theology. He is a psychologist, he is a licensed psychotherapist, and he is particularly interested in human formation in the training of seminarians and religious worldwide. Father Zollner is German and he is a Jesuit. He is the driving force behind the Centre for Child Protection, which has become the centre of reference in preparing safeguarding professionals for our church. There, together with his team, he offers courses from diploma to licentiate level, for anyone seeking to further their safeguarding knowledge and capabilities. Father Zollner is also a founding member of our Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors. Since it was established in 2014 by our Holy Father, Pope Francis, he has led the Commission's work and its efforts in the field of safeguarding formation and education, particularly for church leadership, which isn't just bishops, of course, it is also an essential part of the superior generals of the religious congregations. Out of an estimated 400 initiatives, including workshops, seminars, conferences, conventions, public lectures and congresses, I can estimate that Father Zollner has personally taken part in over half of them on our behalf. He has tirelessly and at no small personal cost crisscrossed the globe to meet and speak with bishops, with religious superiors, with formation leaders, with rectors, with men and women religious and their lay collaborators to boost and to foster awareness of the urgent need to include safeguarding and safeguarding formation as part of initial and ongoing formation 
in priestly and religious life and for all those who work with children and the vulnerable in our church. He also represented our commission on the organizing committee for the February 2019 Safeguarding Conference for Presidents of Bishops' Conferences, convoked by Pope Francis here in the Vatican to really spotlight the church's efforts in this area. However, as an Irish woman, as a Catholic, who was watching the devastating effects of the clerical sexual abuse crisis on her home church enter its fourth generation, as a mother of two small children who is trying to raise and keep them in our church, I firmly believe that Father Zollner has most important and greatest impact to date has been to give a public face and a voice to the church's response to this crisis. Someone who we all, priests, religious and lay people, Catholics and non-Catholics, can look to and listen to. A professional, a priest, proactively engaged in the protection of children and vulnerable people from abuse. He has shown many, above all, those who have experienced abuse directly, their families, their communities, that, they are, that there are people who are listening and are willing to learn, and most importantly, who are not complacent, who do not think in the past tense, but who are looking and thinking ahead and in the present and at future risks. And it was in this vein that in 2017, together with the We Protect Global Alliance and Il Telefono Azzurro, Childline here in Italy, that he had already identified online safeguarding as the next frontier in protecting children and vulnerable. And now, during the current pandemic context, more than ever, so today he will present to us on safeguarding in times of lockdown. Thank you, Father Zollner. Yeah, good morning. Um, thank you very much, Ima, and thank you very much, uh, Sister Pat, for the introduction. Um, and thank you all who are present now and all who will watch this later on. Uh, I really uh, am honored uh, to present to you, uh, to this large audience, through this means, um, which we have come to appreciate in these lockdown times, uh, on uh, the topic that has been already mentioned. And I will now share my presentation. Under the heading of Safeguarding Online in Times of Lockdown. What I want to do is to present um, topics with the following goals. That all of you know more about the risk that exists online, that you become aware of risks online, of online abuse in times of lockdown, that you understand what you can do to safeguard. I will hope that you can also prepare your own project. I would hope that you will have also uh, some idea of what you can do and concretize this during the session we have now. And that you are motivated and committed to safeguarding and to safeguarding online. The sentence in red, though, is a disclaimer. I hear some microphone now. Can this be switched off? Um, so the disclaimer is about all those who um, find this topic very burdensome. Sorry, there is some interference here. Somebody is, is not muted. So again, the disclaimer concerns persons who by uh, listening to me and by reading what you will read on the slides, um, 
may be uh, very much um, impressed, impacted. Some may even be triggered in the sense, this is heavy stuff that is ahead of us. So please be aware of your possible reactions and mind yourself. If it is too heavy for you, please step out. Please close the presentation or move away. Uh, also because I, I can imagine that there are people among those who participate now who have been victims of abuse, of any kind of abuse. And uh, we, we are dealing with this um, straightforward in this presentation. So please be aware that you, you um, take care of yourself. So the internet is um, a great opportunity. Otherwise, we couldn't do what we do now. We bring together 250 plus persons or more um, in this webinar. And we have discovered over the last three months or four that uh, it has brought a change to us and to our working. It is a positive catalyst for innovation, education, and economic growth. So there are many pluses for the internet and all of us enjoy um, what we can gain from it. However, there are serious questions for humanity connected and there are many people who ask those questions about um, the impact on the physical, on the sexual, on the psychological, on the educational, the relational and the spiritual well-being. However, they ask those questions mostly in private. There are not many people, I would say, who really address um, all those consequences. For example, um, the psychological impact or uh, the educational impact on uh, students now in these weeks, in the past weeks, uh, on loneliness on uh, feeling exposed, uh, on feeling abandoned. Uh, there are many questions about how young people today, and not only young people, relate to others. It has changed our way how we communicate and how we understand other people and how we understand our understanding of other people. So how much is that a part of our reflection? Now, I, I think, I guess, most of those who are online for this webinar now are from a generation that is not the generation of the digital native. But anybody below the age of 18, 20, something like that, could be called a digital native almost in all places in the world. And this has changed dramatically the way young people grow up. So um, it is on the basis of these serious questions that we have also to look into the risks that exist online. And now this will be a sort of, um, I mean, list um, of possible risks. Uh, this is true for any time. I will come later to the specificity of the lockdown time. But the internet enables those who would harm children and vulnerable adults by making it easier for them to produce, access, and share sexual abuse material, to find like-minded offenders, and to reduce the risk of detection. So um, that is particularly harmful because uh, there is a new form of trauma that didn't exist before the onset of the, on, uh, of the online world. If you download, if you send on, if you upload, um, if you watch a, a, a picture um, of a child or a video of a child being sexually abused, that is not only, that happens not only once, it can happen millions of times. Every time such an image or video is watched and the victim 
doesn't know who it watches, when and where and where it is stored. So for some victims of this kind of sexual abuse uh, in the internet world, say that this is highly traumatizing. And this is a difference to the hands-on abuse that happens uh, in physical contact. So some of the concepts, what is the child sexual exploitation online? It is accessing, possessing, producing, or distributing videos and photos of child sexual abuse. Please mind your language. Formally, people called it, and still now, many people say um, that this is child pornography. Now, child pornography uh, is, uh, is the wrong concept because it uh, somehow suggests that it is a sort of po pornography um, that people may, may watch uh, as adults legitimately. No, it is child sexual exploitation. And um, another form of that is not only, um, let me say, taking photos or videos of real children, but also digitally generated child sexual material. So on the computer, um, formed, uh, designed uh, stories or images of children, not with real children, um, but uh, uh, resembling, of course, real children. This is also considered uh, child sexual abuse material. Online grooming for sexual purposes means that somebody develops online a relationship with a child to enable their sexual abuse and or exploitation, either online or offline. Now, you will uh, notice that I use the word child uh, because our purpose is first and foremost uh, to talk about safeguarding um, of children, minors of age, below the age of 18. But surely much of what I say and much of this, those risks online uh, are relevant also for adults. Uh, adults in positions or situations of vulnerability and any kind of adult. Because grooming for sexual purposes and for purposes of sexual violence can certainly happen not only with a child, but also with an adult. For example, it can take place in uh, what is called sextortion or revenge porn, which means that um, people coerce and blackmail children, could also be adults, for sexual purposes. That means once they have gotten hands on, um, for example, sexual images that children or adults send them in, so to say, good faith, because they believe it is only for the purpose of this person with whom I chat or I'm in email exchange. Once this person gets hold of that material, uh, can threaten and can blackmail uh, those who have produced uh, those images for the purposes of sexual, financial, or other personal gain. Other risks online are sexting, which means sending receiving or forwarding sexually explicit messages, photographs, or images. And this is unfortunately uh, some kind of sexual abuse that takes place mainly among peers, among minors of age, peers of age. Now, live sexual abuse through webcams, through live streams, uh, especially in countries like the Philippines, uh, this is a, a real scourge and, um, and threatens the safety and the dignity of many children who are sold by their mothers, by their carers, um, to perform sexual activity in front of a webcam that then that material is watched in any place in the world by people who pay for that. 
Then there is cyberbullying and intimidation, as well as political and violent radicalization. All these are risks online, of course. Um, most of it also existed before uh, the onset of the internet age, but it has been bec become much more prominent and has grown enormously in the numbers um, uh, that uh, uh, we, we need uh, to take into account. So what I would now ask um, the office uh, in Rome to do to uh, show us the video. Father, yeah. I can I can show it. Okay. So just a word. This is a video that was um, produced for the opening ceremony of the Child Dignity Congress that Ima had referred to in the introduction in 2017, and it shows the different faces of children um, who talk about, tell about some kind of uh, those risks, they have not been victims themselves. They are actors. Keep this in mind. But it is uh, very powerful. And uh, this is about five minutes, a very um, powerful testimony. All my friends have boyfriends, but no one looks at me. I just wanted someone to talk to, someone to pay attention. When he first messaged me, he said he was friends with one of my friends. I didn't think to check. He was so cute, and he said I was beautiful. He said that I could be a model. When he asked for the first photo, I didn't want to do it. I know I shouldn't have sent it to him, but I wanted him to like me. I wanted him to keep messaging me. But when he asked for a photo of me naked, I knew it was wrong, and I said no at first. He called me a tease, said I was just like all the other girls, just leading him on. He made me feel so bad, I felt like I had to. Now he's saying he's going to post it everywhere. He's going to ruin me if I don't pay him. I'm such an idiot. I already gave him all the money I have, but he keeps asking for more. He's going to send those photos to everyone, to humiliate me. I can't believe I actually thought he liked me. My mate told me how easy it was to make money off of selling. I'd put a post up with the right emojis everywhere online. Some people would message me and we'd meet up somewhere quiet. And boom, cash in my hand. I couldn't believe how easy it was. I finally felt like I had some freedom. But then I sold these pills to this girl and she took too many. Our mate tells me it's her own fault. I feel guilty all the time. Now I hate selling. I wish I could just stop. How can I get away from them? People keep messaging me, asking for more. It's just a matter of time before I get caught out. I'm so paranoid. I don't know who to trust. Who's watching me? It started after I downloaded some game. These ads just started to pop up with these girls asking me if I wanted to chat. Girls don't usually talk to me that much, so I clicked and watched. It was pretty weird, but I kind of liked it. I watched another, and then another, and another. Now I watch them whenever I can. Watching it doesn't feel the same anymore. I keep thinking I'll find something new, something I haven't seen yet. I think about those girls all day. Why don't any of the girls my age look like this? I just can't stop. Sometimes I feel disgusted with myself. People point, stare and swear at me and my family every day. I swear, if I got my hands on them, I'll kill them. I found my brothers in faith, online. Now, we'll be the ones that make them scared. Go back home, they shout. Well, I am home. I know where my brothers are. This is my fight now. Loser, idiot, ugly bitch. That's what they call me. They shout at me, push me around, pull my hair. But then it started online. 
They message me all day and all night on every app. I can't get away from them. I can't even post anything anymore because they'll comment horrible things. Every time my phone vibrates, I get this pain in my chest. There's no escape. What's the point anyway? No one likes me. No one would care. I slept through my chest at school this morning. Who cares about any of it? I'd rather be doing something with my friends, like playing this game. The graphics are really awesome. It's like I'm actually there. I steal cars, kill people, blow stuff up. My mum says I should do sports, study more, but what's the point? I just want to play the game. Yeah, my grades aren't great, but I forget all that when I play. Why should I care? Why should I stop? So it is heavy stuff and I can imagine that um, you would need to digest that and that is the reason why it is necessary that you, you monitor yourself. But uh, this is the reality of young people. And um, um, I want to present to you a few slides with numbers, at least so that you get some idea uh, about the age uh, and the severity of the abuse, the age of victims and severity of abuse that takes place. So you see that um, there is a certain number of abused children uh, below the age of two years. And if you look also to the absolute numbers, not only to the percentage, you see that these numbers are uh, really shockingly high. These numbers come from the Internet Watch Foundation and are in their recent report uh, that you find also on the Internet. This refers uh, to numbers in the UK. You see that the highest number uh, of uh, the age groups uh, of victims in, in the age groups are between 11 and 13 and 7 to 10. So uh, this is really disturbing if you think um, it's not that on the, the images or videos taken are not from uh, adolescence close to adulthood, but it is between the age in the uh, age group between 7 and 13. Um, it is mainly girls who are depicted. Um, as you see last year, according to those numbers, it was 90, more than 90% of girls that uh, are abused sexually online. And the severity is also uh, shocking and horrifying because um, Category A um, that shows sexual activity between adults and children uh, is about 20% uh, last year, 
33% the year before, 33% in 2017. Um, but if you also include category B, images involving non-penetrative sexual activity, not only if you take the, the only um, in inverted commas, indecent images, um, you see that uh, almost half of all the abuse that takes place uh, is a, a severe child sexual abuse. So we talk about highly traumatizing experiences. Now, what I've said until now is true uh, even before times of lockdown. What are the specificities of uh, that what is going on in uh, these uh, weeks and months in which people, because of the pandemic, are locked up in their flats, in their houses, uh, and uh, in wherever they live. Um, police forces across the world are warning that perpetrators are using the lockdown to target children specifically. So they, they take advantage of the present, the current situation. And there are even uh, already uh, over the last weeks, there are numbers that we can refer to. For example, in the UK, there were nearly 9 million attempts in April to access child sexual abuse websites. 9 million attempts in the month of April in the UK only. In Denmark, the number of attempts to access child uh, abuse websites has trebled in the last months. In Spain, reports are up uh, of this kind of abuse up by 20%. Uh, in Australia, downloading of abuse imagery has shot up by 86% in the three weeks after the lockdown uh, was brought about in Australia. 86% more downloading of abuse imagery in Australia. And the uh, the Center for uh, Missing and Exploited Children in the US has registered a 106% increase in reports of suspected child sexual abuse uh, um, uh, in, in the month of March only. What else? Europol the head of the Europol unit on uh, these matters uh, has expressed concern because children are more vulnerable, they are isolated, they are not being as well supervised online, and they are spending more time online during this period than they would have previously. So, of course, you, when you are in, in contact with children, you see that they are um, in the houses or in the flats, um, in the families or in other occasions, they are much more online, which increases the exchange of self-generated material. So self-generated material means uh, children are taking photos of themselves naked um, and they send that around. And they send it around uh, in their on their social media channels. There is an increase in the numbers of emotionally vulnerable children because of the lockdown, because they can't play with others, they have no way to go because they are locked up, because they stay uh, with those carers, with their parents or whoever the carers are. Uh, who may also be um, vulnerable to emotional uh, instability, or they pose a greater risk for increased grooming by offenders. What with parents balancing childcare and homeschooling with other uh, responsibilities, children are much more likely to uh, be exposed to more unsupervised screen time unsupervised screen time, they are sitting hours and hours alone in front of uh, the computer or the tablet or they use their smartphones, unsupervised. Then 
Isolation due to lockdown is likely to increase the probability of offenders acting on their impulses. Um, in the psychology of an offender, of course, it is important to realize how he or she can control their impulses. But in times of lockdown, there are no, no easy facilities for any kind of accompaniment, supervision or therapy or medical advice. So offenders are likely, much more likely to act on their impulses. Economic hardship and the inability of offenders to travel due to lockdown is likely to increase the potential for live streaming abuse in home environments. Uh, restriction, restrictions on social services, on schools and so forth, are um, disrupting the reporting services as well as the ordinary control agencies. The normal day-to-day -day contact that would, to some extent at least, help control what is going on at home doesn't take place. So the current focus within governments and law enforcement on the pandemic and the disruption caused by associated protective measures are leading to lower prioritization of online child sexual exploitation in many jurisdictions. People are taken up, in other words, by their concern for health and for their money. And this is true for all levels of society and all kinds of government institutions. And therefore, there is a higher risk that uh, safeguarding is relegated down the list of priorities. So for anyone who is a survivor of any form of sexual violence, online or on site, hands on, hands off, those news stories about domestic and sexual violence that we, we read day in, day out now, may catch one off guard. And even though one has been coping well until recently, or thought uh, to be coping recently uh, well with that, the sudden intrusion into one's thoughts can take one's mind right back to the trauma. So it is also um, an additional triggering moment for any survivor of any form of sexual violence or exploitation um, in any context. This situation uh, is also uh, more triggering because flashbacks, uh, panic attacks, sleep disruption and nightmares come about because uh, being at home with children and unable to get out uh, with them uh, creates a climate of tension, financial worries, and being trapped at home with one's abuser and being unable to leave. So I have given here the link to um, an agency in Glasgow uh, that is helping people um, uh, who have been abused, uh, have been raped, and um, there you find some material for coping victims, coping during lockdown. Uh, you will receive the, the presentation uh, after uh, our meeting now, our webinar now, so you don't need to write it down, but I thought of um, providing at least those links for uh, other um, information and for the possibility to uh, really find out about good possibilities to, um, to counteract. Now, the safeguarding in a positive way, what can we do? And the first question is, what can carers do? Now, um, carers means, of course, parents uh, or step-parents or any kind of carers in, uh, in institutional settings also. So I have included that. What can carers do? Use parental controls, software tools that allow you to monitor and limit what your child sees and does online. But be aware that this is not foolproof. Um, children are very smart in going around those uh, controls. Um, and, and I have seen uh, some time ago a statistic that many parents who buy such software tools don't even put them in action. Uh, but it is a means that can help to monitor and to limit what children can see and uh, what they do online. 
set time limits. This, of course, needs uh, discussion and sometimes it will create tensions, um, but this is something very important to set limits of time and probably also of space. So, uh, for example, in uh, the living room or in the dining room, we don't have smartphones, we don't use them. No, the apps and the games the kids are using. So, for example, what do they use for chats? And have they enabled the location sharing on their um, on their devices? And how you can switch them off? Turn on strictest privacy settings. So this is uh, something that you can do if you are caring, um, if you are a carer for uh, children, also in a legal uh, way. Co-view and co-play. Give them with your presence also the ability to discern, to find out what is really uh, something healthy and what is uh, threatening or poses a risk. Then, what can schools do? I presume that a good number of you work in schools or in similar institutions. So what can we do in supporting students? Ensure that students know that they can still contact teachers and other support people at your school. Sorry. Set clear expectations about respectful online behavior. Among the peers also. Ensure that students have clear reporting pathways if something negative happens online. Who is the contact person in such cases? How can he or she be found? What are the capabilities um, of this person? Father, could you please speak a, a bit louder? The voice is too low for the interpreters. I am shouting already. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, I will try. So um, model healthy online practices, including using positively framed and supportive language in group meetings and encourage students to check the reliability and credibility of sources. So this is something, of course, that you can provide in times of lockdown, but it is also good for the future that you do uh, provide that also in, um, uh, in explaining and uh, in formation of what is called netiquette, uh, or how do you as users of online fora make sure that you don't overstep boundaries and your boundaries are respected. Then supporting staff in schools. Ensure that the staff, staff has regular uh, communication with their leaders and their support agents and agencies, and that they are also informed about to whom they can turn in case of necessity, in case they encounter uh, difficulties. For example, if they can't reach students for days or weeks, students disappear. I've heard this over the last uh, weeks. How can then those teachers who are concerned about their students be helped by the leaders of the school and other agencies. Encourage the, the staff um, also to seek uh, support if they feel themselves overwhelmed because of the um, necessity to interact in a way that they are not used to do. So uh, for the digital well being and share tips for staff using social media and online collaboration platforms that allow for a, a transparent way of proceeding. So this is what schools or similar institutions can do for their staff, for their teaching staff, as well as for their administrative staff. And finally, what can schools do in supporting families? 
keep the families in the loop with clear, direct communication. I have heard from uh, quite a number of parents uh, over the last weeks uh, full praise for their school leadership as well as for certain teachers and I have heard desperation because some teachers just um, let the families alone and some schools didn't know what to do or what they could offer. So it's necessary that you communicate clearly to families and uh, to be as, as upfront with all what is going on as possible by, for example, reinforcing clear expectations about what is acceptable communication for all members of the school community online and offline. Some families in the school community will have limited or no data to enable online learning. So it would be necessary, at least for those who can afford those schools and certainly uh, for the future to build up contingencies to accommodate all students, not only those uh, who come from family who can afford um, connectivity. And let families know about parent helplines. So this is meant as concrete actions for what schools or similar institutions can do in supporting students, staff and families. I reckon that a good number of you are engaged in this kind of work and therefore it uh, i hope that this uh, is of some help to you now some further help you can find on the links um, through the links that i present here the uh, end violence initiative has a special section for the uh, covid times the australian e-safety um, office, the government's office has a very elaborate uh, web page on this. And then there is the Stop It Now from the UK, where you find a Get Help section that offers uh, prevention help to those who may be concerned about their own sexual behavior or of their loved ones. So people who may um, be let me say, may be inclined uh, to abuse and they want to get help before they really act on their impulses. So you again, you will have those links later on and you will find a lot of material that is gathered and is very helpful. And uh, most of it is also presented uh, in, a, in a very useful way. Now, as I said at the beginning, I do hope that you go away not only with more information, but also with some kind uh, of plan, what you can do, because all of us can do something. Now, uh, I call this prepare your project. And this is an experiment because I've never done so, uh, uh, certainly not with such a large group. Um, I would ask you now to take five minutes and um, thinking about what do you want to do with regard to safeguarding online. And first, you will take one minute for um, becoming aware of your reactions after having listened and seen what you have followed now. Then, for two minutes, think about one or two points that you plan to put in action. And three, Write down those points and give yourself a timeline for implementation. So again, this makes five minutes, but start first, one minute, become aware of your reactions, where you are and what you want to do, because you are now in this kind of mood, in this kind of self-perception, one minute.
Okay. Another two minutes. Think first before you write. Think about one or two points that you plan to put in action with regard to safeguarding online. To what do you want to react? What would you like to take up? Two minutes. And another two minutes, write down the points and give yourself a timeline for implementation, whatever you have in mind. Talking to people, informing yourself, learning more, or whatever you have in mind. So I do hope that you have found something and that you will follow up on that, because this is the whole purpose of this webinar, at least from my side. It's not only about information, it's not only about understanding, it's also about what you can do within the limits of your, your organization and your mission and your position. But each and every one among us can do something to safeguard children online and offline. 
there are many other questions that we could address. For example, um, what can you do to raise the level of awareness in your environment? Is the safeguarding policy, the guidelines, the programs for your institution, for your congregation, for your diocese, wherever you work, are these documents evolving with the current online risks? What can you do to update them? With whom can you work together in safeguarding, especially in safeguarding online? Much of what uh, needs to be done online cannot be done by church agencies. Um, this needs to be done by law enforcement. Uh, but there are many other NGOs, there are many institutions with uh, whom one can partner, especially in the work of safeguarding and safeguarding education. There are lots of very good resources out there that we can make use of. How can you foster the role of families, schools, other institutions, other churches in other religions in safeguard? You personally, your institution, your congregation. What role can the Catholic Church play, the biggest network worldwide, from grassroots to leadership levels to boost safeguarding online. The Catholic Church has a unique a possibility. It's in a unique position. Unfortunately, we don't make use of it because we are very little connected and we don't believe in the possibilities we have. So in 2017, when we concluded the, the Congress, um, on child dignity in the digital world, the participants who came from all corners of the world and from all kinds of professions, from law enforcement and from uh, science and from NGOs and government and whatever, presented to the Holy Father the Declaration of Rome. And there is one sentence um, that calls on us, on all of us. In this era of the internet, the world faces unprecedented challenges if it is to preserve the rights and dignity of children and protect them from abuse and exploitation. These challenges require new thinking and approaches, heightened global awareness and inspired leadership. And if all of us, all 300 or so who we are now online, do what we can do within the reach of our um, competences, our positions, our influence. So some steps will be taken in the preservation of the rights and the dignity of children and their protection from abuse and exploitation. This is something that we certainly need um, to remind us of because this is necessary to, uh, to motivate us to go on in the face of uh, a huge challenge, which is the safety and dignity of children online. And it is, I believe, and with this I conclude, the Lord himself who calls us to do so, um, because he called us and he reminded his um, apostles, his disciples, that the children should come to him and should feel free in the presence of him, in the presence of other adults, in the presence of all who form the church. So I would conclude with this and um, and then we can start the discussion online. I'm not thank sure you. Who. Yeah, thank you very much, Father. Uh, we are going now. I want to invite people to write in the chat if you have some comments, some questions, and Claudia and Emer will select some and will ask to the Father. 
So we'll take some seconds so you can write in the chat and then we'll, we'll select. Just for you to know that we usually save the chat also for future webinars and to listen to your questions and needs. So we keep it, even though we are not, we cannot perhaps use all of them. I saw people commenting here about what you were saying. What are the emotional signs of abused personal? This is one of the questions. I, I leave Claudia and Emer to take care of that. Yes, thank you, Patricia. We also want to thank Father Zollner for this brilliant presentation. And uh, we received many questions prior to this webinar. And one of the areas perhaps that we could address is what concerns also religious uh, men and women uh, and particularly in this area like uh, father zoner you have uh, talked about uh, the uh, danger of uh, sex torsion uh, revenge porn and i wonder if in uh, your research and in your area of expertise information you uh, think that this is something common also for religious if religious are victims of, uh, of these uh, situations as well. Um, yes, of course. Um, victims uh, come from all quarters, come from all corners. Um, okay, one thing is that um, if a person um, is victim of, for example, blackmailing, um, that needs to be addressed uh, right away. Um, and uh, what, what is really difficult to, to do sometimes is to really be uh, honest about this, how one finished up in, uh, in such a situation. Um, this may also refer to periods um, before one entered religious life. Um, what I would also need to say is that our formation houses have not really dealt with, I mean, most of them, uh, with the issue of being victim of online abuse or being a possible perpetrator uh, of abusive behavior and um, for example disseminating abusive material unfortunately uh, for the church uh, setting uh, means formation houses uh, seminaries um, the same is true as for families those who are in charge have very little clue about how young people uh, who, who enter now seminary or formation houses, religious formation houses, how much they are impacted by the um, online world and their social relationships. And uh, simply turning off or taking away devices like smartphones will not sol solve the problem because these young people are smarter than the superiors are and they will have their access. Um, and um, I, I always tell one story um, which should highlight the necessity to really educate young people in the use of uh, those devices. It is more than 10 years that I was uh, in, in a place in Asia in the National Seminary 10 years ago. And um, the the leadership of the seminary brought me to my uh, quarter and um, they said here father you can access uh, the internet here here's the cable etc and i said oh that's interesting so you have internet access in on the premises here and they said yes for the professors but they added last week we cut off the access the connectivity for the seminarians and i said oh how is that and uh, uh, 
the, the director told me, oh, sorry about that. I have to tell you that um, the seminarians were watching pornography. Um, so the, the solution was cutting off the line. However, in the afternoon of the same day, I was walking around in the garden of the seminary and I saw the first seminarian behind a corner and he was watching uh, very intently on his smartphone. I'm not sure whether it was Mother Mary, Mother of God, or any other woman he was watch watching there, but um, uh, that continued. Uh, throughout the garden, I found the guys in different places, and uh, all of them were somehow shocked that I turned up because they thought I, I was spying at them. Anyway, it is a, a, a huge task, but I think we as Catholic religious, we should be <laughs> Uh, capable of educating young people, first of all, in um, help, helping to preserve their own dignity and respect, and that they don't enter into, for example, chat situations where you can easily end up in, in very uh, private details, and you don't know where this goes. But also in terms of um, um, being educated what, what they do and how they uh, consume pornography uh, or child sexual exploitation material. If there are any doubts about that, that has to be addressed immediately. Without fear, without anxiety, upfront, you can clarify things, but they need to be spoken about. Thank you. I'm reading, we are receiving many other questions and another very interesting one I'm, I see here is from Miriam Willens. She's asking, as a canon lawyer, I sometimes meet situations in religious institutes where the culture of speaking about having become a victim is limited. There is also shame among the leadership to report it to the police. How can such a culture be changed? How can culture be changed? Um, one, it needs a clear clarity about what are the laws and what are the rules. The church law uh, and all documents referring to uh, child sexual abuse and beyond indicate that the church cannot pretend to have a separate area where the law of the state uh, of the government does not apply. All of us have to abide and follow through with the law of the country in which we live, period, full stop. So you need also to be aware what, uh, uh, what are your obligations and what is the law um, telling you, for example, in terms of reporting. Secondly, um, culture, you change culture, not in one instance, in one moment. Uh, however, uh, it, it needs asking oneself, what are my possibilities? Honestly, what can I do, for example, to report or to support a victim of abuse? I know very well, I have traveled the world and I, I know very well that there are cultural conditions that make it very difficult uh, for people to, to act uh, in the protection of minors um, and vulnerable adults and uh, in reporting crimes that have been committed. I'm almost daily, I'm, um, uh, I'm in contact with people who, who ask questions about this. How can I address that in my country, in my constituency and so forth? Um, we don't change culture uh, if we don't change our own attitude. We ourselves, and this is why I insisted on each one here participant, all of us can do something. And if all of us changed a little bit in our attitudes with regard to, um, for example, reporting, uh, in finding out what can be really helpful for victims um, by not putting them at a higher risk, because this sometimes that may also happen if you, if you report in some countries, police forces are not functioning well. And, uh, the perpetrator may even 
be at home or may may have more possibilities to abuse uh, once it is reported so you need also to be very careful in what you do so that you don't put the, the victim at a higher risk however if abuse is going on and you are aware of it you need to report to somebody at least who can step in uh, it may be very difficult to find uh, such a person but you 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 have a moral obligation to do so because the, the, the life of a child the life of a vulnerable person is possibly destroyed if you don't do anything and thirdly and lastly i believe we change culture in the combination of abiding to laws and um, education and formation and and the best education sorry to say in, in these terms uh, i don't want to to instrumentalize this but the best education is if you once listen to a victim of abuse and um, then you know why you you need to act and why you need to step in even at personal cost Thank you. I give the floor to Dr. McCarthy. the microphone try to take off the headphones maybe is it possible yeah. oh. can you hear me now yeah okay thank you um okay so the next question we have is from argentina father hans and it says um how can we be assertive in the way we communicate with families and um, that maybe are experiencing a context where they are living with both aggressor and victim so a difficult situation I, I didn't understand the, the verb what was that they say how can we be assertive so how can we be assertive in communicating with, with families who are living in a situation where they are living with both aggressive aggressor and victim in the same family so pastoral outreach and work with families where there is both a victim and an aggressor living there? How can they be assertive in safeguarding or in communicating with them? Yeah, first of all, if you are aware of such a situation, you would need to uh, really, um, to really um, inform the rightful authorities. If you, if you have a suspicion, uh, uh, let me say, um, a substantiated suspicion that something in terms of abuse is going on your first responsibility is to uh, inform police or any social service um, uh, with the capacity to intervene um, if for whatever reason that is not possible or, or whatever there are a few things that you can do very practically you can call the family at random times and ask inquire, inquire how things are very uh, how to say uh, in, in a very innocent way uh, or you can if you live close by you can bring some food and, and ring at the door and say do you need that so this would for example this would give uh, the sign that the, the family is not cut off completely and that there are people who may be listening, who may be perceiving something, uh, who may uh, be capable of, um, of intervening. So um, these are some practical things that can be done, but uh, don't overestimate your capacities and competences. Your competence and your capacities, if you know something uh, that looks like a suspicion then, call police or call uh, somebody who can authoritatively intervene. And the final question, which is perhaps looking forward from this presentation, 
a kind of almost what happens next. What would be your safeguarding concerns or are there new challenges for online safeguarding in the post COVID-19, post pandemic context that are already beginning to concern you? Yeah, in general terms, um, I, I, as I said before, I, I believe honestly that safeguarding and safeguarding minors in the church and in the state in the countries um, has suffered a severe blow in terms of public attention and in terms of public funding and and other funding um, which is to say we have realized that something has happened to my understanding uh, what you can see in in many parts of the world um, where natural catastrophes um, economic crisis, major health issues, lack of stability in society, um, wars, civil wars going on, um, made it very difficult for society and for church to focus on the safeguarding of minors because there are so pressing needs, uh, there are so uh, heavy burdens on people that they think that uh, safeguarding minors um, is, is uh, some extra uh, and we can we cannot afford to think about that because we we need to survive first yes that is true uh, the need to survive is first but also the, the need to, to respect and to preserve the dignity of all people and especially the, the most vulnerable one so i think we will stick we will need to stick together to bring safeguarding up the ladder of priorities again. Uh, unfortunately, I I doubt that this will be a, a very easy task um, because this is such a, a challenging, um, uh, such a nasty topic that people don't want to to engage and don't want to commit easily with it. So it needs also our decision, all our decision, all those who are present now, uh, that uh, means that we will continue this journey, um, even in the face of uh, reluctance to take it on again. Uh, the second concern it refers to, uh, to uh, the internet world. Um, many people say that because of the pandemic, because of the necessity to work more online, to be more online, uh, in schools, in universities, in work, in whatever work setting, um, in all probability, the digital world will acquire an even bigger importance and will uh, have a, a bigger share of our time and our energy spent in front of screens. So uh, what is true for young people, those digital natives that I mentioned before, uh, will become more and more true also for religious, for um, for priests, for seminarians, for people in formation, and um, and for society at large. Uh, so, I think a major concern is: do we really come up with um, a common understanding what what we uh, how we educate young people in school, in university, in formation? for the proper use of the internet. Um, how do we enforce rules? How do we take up our pedagogical challenge on this? Um, I don't see much uh, investment in this area, um, maybe because many people who work in, in this field are far away from, from youth and they don't understand how much this has already changed the brains and the relationships among young people. But in any case, uh, these are the major concerns. We need uh, to, to realize that this is something that has acquired uh, a, a huge importance in our life and it, it cannot be uh, let going uh, like um, uh, nobody's caring for it. We, we need to really uh, develop um, some ethical uh, uh, attitude and understanding of what we do when we 
uh, interact with people on the net, what are the risks, and how can I protect myself and other people from being abused? Thank you very much, Father Zoll. Now the chat is literally inundated with people thanking you for this presentation, above all because not only is it informative, it was interactive, and there are many requests for access to the materials you've presented and shared with all the participants. And I would just like to um, assure people that the video uh, recording of Father Zollner's presentation will be posted to our websites, UISG and the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors websites later today, as soon as is possible, and you can access and watch back there. Um, in conclusion, my thanks not only to Father Zollner for his uh, tireless work and efforts in this area, but also to the, uh, the uh, International Union of Superiors General, who really have been leading the way within our church and showing how greater sharing between the different realities of our church is essential, not only in the area of safeguarding of minors, but in so many other areas where you are all engaged in your pastoral work and in your apostolates. And one takeaway I would like to underline from Father Zollner's uh, excellent presentation is above all how the Catholic Church, we all, all of us in our own way, are in, as he said, a unique position which is underutilized. So this is the challenge we have now. We have to find a better use for all of this. We need to foster uh, and we really need to garner the work of families, schools and other institutions. These are all areas where the religious are involved at every level of the church life um, and we have to work together greater sharing and greater efforts and now in this this pandemic reality where there are so many restrictions on resources we are beholden all of us to pool our efforts in this area our thanks to all of you for joining us today our thanks to the uisg the center for child protection which is led by by father zollner and his wonderful team over there to telefono zuro uh, which is led by our other member Professor Ernesto Caffo uh, and for their attention to detail uh, and in joining us in this webinars. Our next appointment is for June 30th, where we will have um, Dr. Gabriel De Leaco from the Philippines. He is also a clinical psychologist. He is a professor in this area. He's worked with both victims and perpetrators. He also has a center for formation and safeguarding there in the Philippines. And above all, in my opinion, he does this all by being father of five children. So no person better placed to talk to us about victimology and the relational, relational safety model. It will be at 11.30 CEST and we would ask you all to join us again. Once registration is open, we will send out the links to you all, we will tweet. Thank you to all, thank you to Patricia, Sister Florence and Claudia from the International Union of Superiors General who really are the backbone of organizing these webinar series uh, and we hope to see you virtually again soon in a couple of weeks time. Bye-bye.